All right, folks. Well, nice to see you. I'm uh, surprised to have some, some folks in the room despite the, the holiday, but that's great. Uh, going to teach class and then go home and cook for my parents. So uh, let's see here. Uh, in terms of announcements and things, I think I, I, I'm not sure I can make it in for my office hours tomorrow. If you have questions for me, and uh, no, I, I offered to move them and then nobody asked for a particular time. So, um, I can hang out for a little bit after class today, uh, and if you put messages online, we can, we can certainly do that. Um, your homeworks are, uh, I guess, due today. Uh, and then uh, your next homework, uh, hopefully, will go out soon. If it hasn't already gone out, it's, it's written and, and ready to go. Um, and that'll be it uh, after that. So you have one last homework and an exam for this class, and then, and then we're done. Um, on this homework, there's an extra credit problem, which basically says that you can do revisions on your midterm exam. So if, uh, basically, what we're offering is up to 50% of your points back if you, for each uh, question that you write up. You know, correctly this time. <laughs> um, any uh, questions, comments, concerns about boring organizational stuff? Quiet bunch. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, today we're going to start something completely new, uh, and this is sort of like the third chunk of this class. Um, you know, this being a big kind of survey of all things numerical. Uh, so, so far, we've talked about what? We spent about the first third of this class talking about linear system of equations and matrices. Uh, then the second third talking about iterative methods for optimization and related problems. Now, in our last uh, part of the class, we're going to worry about sort of inferring objects that aren't just vectors or numbers, but also functions, right? So in particular, um, we're going to talk about what it might mean to interpolate a function given some values from its sample points. That's what we're up to today. We're going to talk about uh, numerical integration and differentiation. And then we'll con uh, conclude by talking about some methods for differential equations. Um, so here, you can kind of think of your unknown as an entire function, like f of x or f of t. Uh, and the job of your numerical algorithm is to fill in the missing information. Um, the good news also is that I feel like the last couple lectures got pretty dense in this class. And even if that is the case, uh, we're kind of we're hitting a reset a little bit here. Uh, because this is a new set of topics. And so even if it, we totally lost you before, um, this is a bit independent of, of what came before, it, which is probably a good thing for, for some of you guys. Okay, so with that uh, kind of broad motivation, uh, now we're going to start talking about interpolation, which is the, the sort of very first problem in this, in this space of things where the unknown is a function rather than just a vector or a number. Um, I mean, the way to think about it, an another way to kind of frame here is that, of course, we, we, we've come up with all kinds of tools for analyzing functions like computing their roots, the minima, their maxima, and so on. Um, but really, the situation that we're in now is that we have an entire function as our unknown, uh, which is really the theme of, of the remainder of this course. And there's so many different versions of this, um, interpolation being the simplest one. Uh, and, and, and of course, there's, there's no shortage of applications for interpolation tools, and many of you have probably used them whether you know it or not. Uh, so for example, a very typical one uh, in computer graphics here involves texture lookups. I don't know, has, has anybody either taken a graphics class or implemented such an object? Um, yeah, so here's a very typical situation. Let's say that I have a 3D model of a human body. A very typical way to store it is as a triangulated surface, like this object that you see on the left-hand side. It's exactly what it sounds like, just a bunch of triangles. And the problem, um, which you can even kind of see here, is that the triangles are typically larger than the size of a pixel on your screen. Right? Um, and in some sense, they kind of have to be. Like, you know, if I get close enough to any triangulation of a surface, eventually triangles will look really big. Fun fact. Um, a very typical sort of observation is that we, we, we tend not to need to store geometry on quite as high resolution as texture. And so a very typical thing to do is to store an image with a texture, like here's the skin that I'm going to wrap onto the hand here. Um, and then essentially what happens is every triangle has these little coordinates onto the image plane. Right? So when it was, uh, in the rendering process, if I want to render a hand with a, hand, with a skin texture on it, Right? The first thing I'll do is figure out sort of, ah, this pixel is in this triangle. And now, inside of this triangle, it has some other counterpoint, uh, counterpart in the, uh, the image here. Um, which, so the, like for every pixel location in 3D, or really on the, the image plane, there exists some pixel color uh, location on, the, on the, the texture here. And your job is to basically borrow the color of the texture and put it onto the, the color of the surface. Um, and sadly for us, camera projections are rarely chosen strategically uh, and in particular, um, the location of that purple dot on the right-hand side is very unlikely to be an integer. Um, so at the end of the day, you have this grid of pixel colors, and you need to interpolate between them to, to actually find the right color. 
In fact, actually, the, the issues here are quite subtle. Um, I would love to give you a whole lecture on textual lookups. There's some really fantastic and tricky algorithms here. Um, it turns out that magnification is actually the easier problem. Magnification being like what are in between pixels of your texture, right? So like if I get really close to this hand, I'm gonna see like all kinds of stuff. Um, the larger issue is actually what, what, what graphics people call minification. Um, and just to give you a tiny preview into the computer graphics world if you're curious, um, the inclination here would be like, aha, like JPEGs are really easy to compress. I can store a really high fidelity image of skin texture, right? And somehow that feels like the right thing to do, right? And then I can, like maybe I have a bit of a chunky 3D model, but at least the texture's pretty good. But it turns out that actually causes a lot of problems in, in computer graphics pipelines. Um, so here's, here's, here's one kind of just thought thing. If you like this stuff, you should take graphics class. Um, let's say that I, I render the hand on the left-hand side, and I look at two different adjacent pixels, right? So two different purple dots on the screen that are right next to each other. Those correspond to two different locations on the texture image on the right, right? So let's say that the texture image is really, really dense. So like I, I store a ton of pixels, like get like a microscopy <laughs> hand texture here. Um, those two adjacent pixels on the left-hand side, where are they gonna end up on the texture map on the right? Really far apart, right? And if you look at this texture on the right-hand side, notice the colors oscillate between a pretty large range here. There's like the, the sort of skin, skin tone, you know, beige color. There's the white of the reflection. Um, and, and it's happening in some kind of random pattern. So if I throw a dart and it's pretty far away from the first guy, there's like a whole distribution of colors that I could get, right? And, and if I perturb the pixel ever so slightly on the left-hand side, it's gonna move really big distances over here. So you're gonna traverse a huge range of possible colors in this texture map. So what do you think the, uh, the rendered image is gonna look like? Noise. <laughs> because in effect, all you're doing is just throwing darts in this giant texture map in far, far away points, and you know, like, who knows if you're gonna get something smooth or not. So actually, this, there's, um, I would love to give you a whole lecture on the, the techniques and, and ways that people uh, overcome these particular issues, but beyond the interpolation problems that we'll talk about today, texture minification is actually the larger issue and is related to aliasing and all the other uh, challenges that, that computer graphics people mumble a lot about. You look concerned. Do they probably do some kind of blur That's right. So actually the better thing to do is basically blur this image out before you sample it, right? Yeah. Um, what would be the optimal low-pass filter? Yeah. Uh, usually, you know, we talk about it being sync, right, for a band-limited uh, signal. Yes? Um, is there a reason why it's like, I mean, you could, like, try to compute an integral or something like that, but the default is just to sample a single color value, right? Um, in which case, you know, the ratio between the size of the image on the right and the left is really the issue here. Um, of course, interpolation problems are not just in computer graphics. They're everywhere. They're unavoidable. Um, we've, already, we've already talked about uh, one instance of this, uh, which is regression, right? So here we're given some values of a function um, at a few isolated points, and our job is to come up with uh, basically a prediction of what that function value would be somewhere else. If we trust the values of our function at those isolated points, then uh, our regression problem becomes more of an interpolation problem, right? Like, we, we don't feel like we need to regularize or have our regressed curve not touch these things exactly. In fact, uh, these days, a lot of people are beginning to argue that uh, neural network uh, style regression tools often are closer to interpolation in the sense that um, many modern uh, neural networks actually overfit to their data quite a bit. And the kind of interesting um, surprise is that sometimes they also generalize okay, um, which goes against some of the classical machine learning theory. Um, if you like this kind of stuff, there's a fantastic lecture online um, on this phenomenon called the double descent curve, um, which is uh, by Misha Belkin. Um, I don't know, has anybody ever heard of this, this kind of phenomenon? So let's see if I get this plot right. So here I have, um, I don't know, this is maybe the number of, of neurons uh, in my neural network or possibly the number of uh, training iterations. And here I have maybe the, uh, the error, uh, like the generalization error of my network. So I uh, have some function that I'm fitting, like these, these black points, and now I have some black points that I've withheld. I fit my neural network to this data, and now I observe it at the points that I, I withheld and ask how well did I reconstruct. Right? 
So if I don't train for very long or I have a not very expressive network, then my error is pretty high, right? Because my network just doesn't have the capacity to learn stuff. Then for a little while, the error decreases, and then eventually it starts to increase again, right? And does anybody know what this, this phenomenon is called? If you've ever taken a machine learning course, you've seen this curve before. Overfitting, right? The idea that like my network is kind of contorted to my data, and then somehow the interpolation, in fact, we'll see examples of overfitting basically later in this lecture, even though we're just talking about polynomials. Um, you know, like the, th the function in between somehow looks super weird, right? But then, with, uh, this is just a modern theme, just in case you're curious about interesting research uh, things that people are thinking about these days. The empirical observation that folks are making is that, like, so this, this is classical machine learning theory. <laughs> what people have found empirically is a really weird phenomenon, <laughs> which is that. <laughs> that there's actually a second curve that happens um, where you have now basically totally overfit to your data. Right? So by the way, you could also look at the network, just like how well does the network fit the training data, and obviously that curve looks something like this. Right? Um, what people are finding with neural network uh, representation specifically is that you can overfit your data, keep training, and actually begin to generalize more. And that's because it turns out that somehow the structure of these networks itself is a reasonable smoothness prior. Uh, we're not going to cover any of this in today's lecture. We're going to talk about the very classical considerations and interpolation. But there were actually, it's kind of funny because we all think of interpolation as this problem from like the 1700s that we don't think about anymore. But actually, there's still like very modern things to be done in this space and, and a lot of open questions. Chris, you look very concerned. I think you can, you can get a double descent curve for like linear predictors which are over-parameterized. So. Yeah, the, for, that, for that universe, I think it's like almost a simpler story, right? It almost yeah. looks like the homework problem that, yeah, that so we really have. Just it's just a, a regression thing. But the kind of weird thing is even in these crazy neural networks with stochastic gradient descent, there's some kind of nice smoothing happening. Okay. So, unlike some of the crazy problems that we've talked about, I mean, like, for example, ADMM in the previous lecture, I think it's really kind of tough to articulate what the input and the output is. Uh, now we're back on very stable ground, right? So, so in, for an interpolation problem, the input here is obviously a set of xy pairs, um, and the output is a function f of x that you can query at other points x. Um, incidentally, if you're in machine learning, I suppose sometimes people talk about what inductive versus transductive machine learning. I always confuse the two. One of them is uh, basically the difference between these settings is one of them would be like I train f to be a neural network or linear function or whatever, and then I can just put in whatever x's I want. The other version of the story would be I have a list of x's where I don't know why, and that is the list of x's <laughs> that I know ahead of time that oh, whose value I'm going to fill in. Right? So anyway, there, there's slightly different uh, trade-offs for, for algorithms in these two cases. Um, we can contrast this term with regression, by the way. And, and all of these are, are, are kind of fluffy technical terms that people use incorrectly all the time. But, but uh, anybody want to take a stab at sort of the general understanding of difference between interpolation and regression? Just linguistically speaking, like what would be, what would be you guys' guess? Regression is function of Possibly. I, mean, I, I think you're almost there. I, I think, uh, yeah, Axel? That's right. So I think in interpolation, the, the baseline assumption is usually the, the function f of x actually goes through the, the data that, that went in, like the xy pairs. Whereas in regression, um, you have an additional conceit, which is that the xy pairs are themselves somewhat inaccurate, and it's okay if your function doesn't go through them. Right? Um, there's obviously a lot of wiggle room between these two domains. For example, that this double descent curve that I drew before, even in this sort of overfitting regime, it's unlikely to be an exact interpolant. Could get close. Cool. All right. So for our initial problem that we're going to consider for most of the time today, we're just going to worry about one-dimensional regression. So our, our xy pairs here, um, you know, xi, yi are really just in the real numbers across the real numbers, which is, of course, just fancy notation for a bunch of pairs of numbers. <laughs> um, but here's the problem, of course. The set of all possible functions on the reals is a really, really big set. It's even bigger than like Rn. It's hella big. It's uncountably big. It's more than uncountably big than the real numbers are uncountably big. It's huge. Um, and so working in this space is obviously too large. Now there are some exceptions to that rule. I mean, like if you look down the universe of like variational calculus, 
you could like ask for like what is the f that extremizes some objective function. Um, but this is a, a computational class, and that's mostly a theoretical object. Um, and so here we don't we don't get to do that kind of thing. Like we actually need to represent f on a computer. Um, so we need some way to take this set and, and basically discretize it, right? Um, so the most common strategy, sadly for us, we can't get away from it in 6S955, is basically to use linear algebra tools. And how do we do it? Somebody cooks up a set of fixed functions, phi 1, phi 2, dot, 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 phi n, k, whatever. And now I represent my interpolant as a sum over i of, of coefficients in front of the phi i. Okay, and as long as I have enough phi i's, I can try and convince myself that I can actually do interpolation as opposed to regression. Right? Notice, by the way, both interpolation and regression often go this way, right? Like in your homework, at this point, you're probably totally sick and tired of doing kernel regression problems, and they, they really fall into this category as well. So, what would be a good place to start? Like, what, what, where, where do you think I'm going to go with this? That's the obvious choice of a set of phi's for, for one dimensional regression. Yeah, you, you got so close to raising your hand and you aborted on the way up. <laughs> we, we, we're in, in function space, but in a sense, it is the standard basis for a set of functions. Yeah. Polynomials, that's right. Well, you can't, you can't cover regression unless you talk about polynomials. I regret to inform you. It also turns out that polynomials are arguably like the worst functions for regression in a lot of ways, but, but certainly all the classical theory uh, uh, falls into this, and, and it does illustrate many of the, the problems that we run into in this space. Yep. So, will be a reasonable basis for, by the way, I probably won't use phi i, let's, let's use phi k instead, because I feel like i looks like imaginary i, which is a little weird. Um, and yeah, uh, proposal, so let's say that I, I care about, I don't know, um, polynomial of degree of um, degree uh, up to k minus 1. First of all, how big is this space? How many dimensions? You might notice I have a k minus 1. Yeah, this is a k-dimensional space, because you've got to remember that the, the constant function is a polynomial. Yeah? So, what would be a good basis? What should I choose for the five? Monomials. <laughs> Tell me more, Harry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's... Uh, we're not going to play ball here. Huh? So p0 of x, we could have be the, the one function. Uh, p1 will be x to the one, which is just x. p2 is x squared, and so on. Totally reasonable basis. Now, um, mathematically, or in, in uh, asterisk algebra class, you spend a lot of time worrying about this uh, basis. It makes sense, because it's, but like in, 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 in some universe, you could ask, like, why did God choose this basis? Like, why, why do we spend so much time thinking about the monomials? It's actually a reasonable question. Like, x squared minus 2 is also a polynomial. So why, why do we work in this basis so much? I would argue it's mostly because, like, chalk is, is, is hard to, to write with. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, so we're, we're used to just thinking about these because it's sort of the most compact thing. But actually, it turns out, for numerical analysis purposes, and by the way, purposes in a lot of other branches of math, this is a horrible basis. The monomials basically don't tell you anything about a lot of the problems that you might want to solve with a polynomial. So, for instance, ah, yes. Obviously, I'm going to tell you why. I know, I'm just going to drop the book and leave the classroom. That's it, we're done. Um, so, let's say that I, I want a polynomial. Um, and I prescribe its values at like, you know, x equals 0, x equals 4, and x equals 17. Right? Is it obvious what coefficients should go in front of the monomials to, to interpolate that data? No. So in fact, let's, let's play through that a little bit. So let's say that I have a bunch of xy pairs. Now, right, so I've got uh, x, I guess that's why I didn't use k, because I've got k over here. Fine, fine, fine. xi, yi, like that. So what do I know about my uh, monomial, right? So, so remember that now I've got a function of the form um, f of x is equal to the sum a uh, i p i of x, like that, right? So in particular, in the monomial basis, we have that this is the sum a i x to the i. This is not imaginary i. This is i equals 0 to k minus 1 for the monomial. I get like a little triggered when I see x to the i. I don't. I've always hated this in math books. Even when like this whole book doesn't involve imaginary numbers, it just weirds me out. 
OK. Um, so what are we to do? Well, we have a bunch of x, y pairs. So first of all, how many pairs do I need if my, my monomial is of degree k minus 1? k. I need k pairs, right? Because it's a k-dimensional space. So for each of my x, i, y, i pairs, oh no, now I have, um, I have two i's. So let's make these j's. <laughs> OK. So what do I know? I know that y, j is equal to uh, maybe a, uh, how did I choose to do this? a0 plus a1 x1 plus, oh sorry, xj rather, uh, plus a2 xj squared plus, I almost made exactly the mistake I was about to caution you out to make, um, plus a k minus 1 xj to the k minus 1. Right? And this is for each j from, from you know, 1 to k. Does that make sense? What is my unknown here? Remember, my input data are the xy pairs. What do I not know? Yeah. I don't know the a's, right? I don't know this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. So secretly, I think this is like one of these common misconceptions that often catches students. This is a linear expression in my unknowns. <laughs> do you see that? Because the x's are knowns. They might as well be constant numbers. The things that I don't know are the a's. Yes? Same reason the discrete Fourier transform is linear. Well, I suppose you could think of the discrete Fourier transform as precisely this in the, the roots of unity, if you want to be fancy about it. OK, that's cool. OK, um, I usually would go the opposite direction. But <laughs> if you're, as a, 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 I guess, a, a, a signals person and you're used to thinking about Fourier transforms, then I, I love that for you. Um, OK, so um, if I take each of these expressions, I stack them together into a matrix, I get a very famous matrix. right? So at the end of the day, you know, I need some matrix times a not dot 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 a k minus one equals, I guess, y one to y k. And what's going to go here? Well, it's going to be like one x one x one squared, one x two x two squared, and so on. Right? Anybody remember the name of this matrix? It has a fancy name. Yeah, thank you. It's called the Vandermond matrix. This is an annoying matrix to work with. Um, it's not symmetric. It's not positive definite. It doesn't have any of the nice properties that we usually like in this class. The property that it has is that it's a Vandermond matrix. Um, and there actually are specialized algorithms for inverting this thing, um, for inverting matrices specifically of this form. To my knowledge, they're not particularly well used or liked, certainly by your instructor. Um, but it does uh, exist. Um, but generically, uh, using the machinery in this class, notice that it would take cubic time to, to solve this problem, right? So in other words, like from a runtime perspective, if I give you n data points and I say, give me the degree, I guess, n minus 1 polynomial that goes through all those points, I would need cubic time in order to solve that problem. Does that make sense? And by the way, that, that, feels, that feels wrong <laughs> in the sense that, like, how, how much time does it take for me to evaluate this polynomial? Well, now it's just linear, right? I just, I just need to, to go through the, the coefficients here. Yeah? So, so that's sort of the issue with the monomial basis, right? It's, it's a reasonable basis for algebra. It's very good if you're doing ring theory. Not so great if you're, if you're doing uh, numerical stuff. There's like a mild riot happening in the hallway. OK, so um, beyond that, by the way, like, Certainly, in this class, we have the machinery for solving this system. I mean, we, you could easily solve for A. God knows you guys all know how to do this in this class like 100 times over. Um, here's an interesting issue. So let's say all of the x's are between 0 and 1, just to, to make my life a little easier. What do you think about, what, what is the conditioning of this, of this matrix? Is this, is this a well-conditioned matrix? Depends how far apart my points are. Well, right, but if I have a bunch of points in the room between 0 and 1, they can't be too far apart. I can give you an upper bound. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's right. Paul has exactly the right intuition, which is that inches of this matrix are like numbers less than 1 took into a very large power. And so they're all going to be close to 0, right? I even plotted it for you just for fun. Um, and in particular, like, if, if you think of this as a numerical problem, like, remember what conditioning says? It kind of says, like, 
it, it's looking at like if as I change my input data, how is my output going to change, like that kind of thing. So here's one way to think about it. Like we're used to thinking about polynomials like one and x and x squared, and those are like nice, like cute, fun-looking functions. But eventually, for really, really high powers k, these functions look really similar to each other. Do you see that? Like. Like here's the, you know maybe x to the twenty and x to the twenty first or something I forget I don't remember how many I put in this plot yeah and in particular like let's say that I did this regression all my x's are between zero and just for for convenience in my x there was a bug in my code and I swapped the last two coefficients this is like an everyday experience in my lab not with Chris though he's good um, <laughs> notwithstanding I think the bug we were just talking about a few days ago um, the uh, 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 What's my, my error of my regression going to be? Almost none. Remember, that's sort of the definition of conditioning, is that there's like multiple ways to solve the same problem that, that like all look kind of the same. So like necessarily polynomial regression for high degree polynomial is, is very ill-conditioned. You can like see, just swap around the last couple coefficients at will and get very similar looking functions. By the way, even outside of 0, 1, this is true. It's just it's harder to plot because they get very big. <laughs> it's a little bit of scaling to make the same argument. OK, so, so hopefully I've convinced you that, yeah, like monomials are cute. Like they fit in a very small amount of space. But, but at least for our purposes today, maybe they're not the most useful spaces. Sorry, Harry. Luckily for us, there is no shortage of bases in the universe out there for polynomials. There are so many bases. And I think this is actually an important takeaway that, like, you know, God didn't give us the monomials. It's, it's literally just a computational convenience because it's just easy to write and think about. But like, there are other things that span the same set. So like, I can equally write polynomials in many different ways, and some of them are just more convenient for, for computation. So let's go on the opposite extreme and introduce a basis that looks totally weird, but actually is in some sense, at least on paper, the most convenient possible basis for the interpolation problem, specifically the interpolation problem. For other stuff, um, not so much. That basis is called the Lagrange basis. Now, first of all, this thing doesn't even look like a polynomial, but, but it is, right? Because notice the denominator here is basically a constant because it depends on the xi's. The numerator is a bunch of products of xi's. And the question is, like, why the hell did I choose this thing? And I think this is one of those ones where if I just do a quick example, you're going to immediately see why this is such a clever choice, why Lagrange was onto something. By the way, I think it's super cute that like, every French guy in the 1800s like, named a polynomial after themselves. Um, so, let's try, um, how many x's do we want to do? How about four? Okay, so we'll do x1 equals zero, x2 equals, I'm going to do the same as my notes just so that I can check, um, x3 equals three, x4 equals two. So remember what this means. This means that like I have a polynomial, like I have a bunch of xy pairs, and these are the x's. <laughs> That's what it's saying, right? And I claim so. First of all, this is going to become a basis for what degree polynomial? Careful now. I have four x's. The degree three polynomial. I'm going to keep repeating that. You know, what would be a great exam question is if I ask you to do the, exactly that kind of argument, because I like to catch you on off by one things. Okay, so. First of all, let's, let's kind of read what this notation is saying. It's saying that like, so there's, there's a different phi for each i, right? So in this case, from one to, to four, right? The numerator, I do x minus xj for every j except for i. And the denominator, I do the same thing, but now I substitute an xi, okay? So this expression looks complicated, but I think we can literally just write it down for this example, and you'll see the clever construction that's happening here. Lagrange is a, a, a sharp guy in this one, okay? So what is phi one of x? Well, in the numerator, I have x minus xj for every j except for 1. So it's going to be x minus 2, x minus 3, x minus 4, like that. The denominator is going to be 0 minus 2 times 0 minus 3 times 0 minus 4, which is some number. I don't even care. I don't even care. Okay. Um, I also have a phi 2. Let's just do one more of these things. So now it's everything except the second guy, right? So it's going to be x times x minus 3 times x minus 4 divided by, uh, do, 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 do. I guess, 2 times 
2 minus 3 times 2 minus 4. I feel like a high school algebra teacher. This is fun. Do, I want, do, you, want, do you want me to write the other two? I can. Don't make, don't make me write the other two. Okay, but first of all, do you guys agree with me that like I have successfully applied the formula on the screen? Okay. Do you also agree with me that these are polynomials? Because they don't look like monomials anymore. But notice that I can write out this product and then they look like monomials. And moreover, there are four of them, right? Now there are four of these things. They are all degree three polynomials. It's easy enough to check that they're linearly independent. So this is a basis for degree three polynomials. It's not the monomial basis, but it's a basis. Does that make sense? Now, why on earth would I choose this basis? Well, let's see something. What happens if I do phi one of zero? Well, I have zero minus two, zero minus three, zero minus four. Conveniently, the denominator is zero minus two, zero minus three, zero minus four. So this is one. What is phi one of two? Well, there's an x minus two in the numerator, so it's zero. What's well, phi one of three? Well, there's an x minus three, so it's zero. What's well, phi one of four? Zero. What's well, phi one of five? I have no idea. So it's like some big number. Yeah. <laughs> Just careful, careful here. Um, okay. So, so um, this seems like a really useful property. Right? Now, let's look at phi 2. What's phi 2 of 0? Well, there's, a, there's an x in the, in the numerator, so 0. What's phi 2 of 2? Well, notice there's a 2, 2 minus 3, 2 minus 4. 2, 2 minus 3, 2 minus 4. So this is 1. Phi 2 of 3 equals 0. Phi 2 of 4, 0. So do you see what we did here? Lagrange was really sneaky. These things are polynomials. They don't look, they like, they're not the kind of polynomial we're used to because we've written their factorization, but they're polynomials. And they have this really convenient property, which I can state in a more clean fashion as follows, right? That phi i of xl is equal to one when l and i are the same and zero when they're not. So why does this matter for interpolation? By the way, here's a, here's a plot of exactly the example we just did. I just think it's pretty. I don't know how meaningful it is. Um, no, 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 but actually it is meaningful. So, so for example, if you look at phi 1, notice that it like hits a 1 on the left, and then it hits 0, 0, 0, and so on. So like it really does have the pattern that we said. What was that? Does the sum of these things always equal 1? Oh, that is a good question. I believe the answer is yes. In fact, the, the answer is certainly yes. And we can, we will, it, I will prove it to you in a minute. Okay, here's a way to think about it. Like, let's say that I have a bunch of xy pairs, four of them, right? So these are the x's, and the y's are all ones. There's a unique degree three polynomial, which satisfies that, and it's the polynomial one. And since we're about to use this thing for an interpolant, like a, that had better be the case. Okay, so um, how do I use this thing for, for interpolation? So now remember that I have a bunch of pairs, xi, yi. What's my polynomial? It, like, actually, it couldn't be simpler. Do you see this? Because in particular, I claim that the following is my interpolant. f of x is equal to the sum over i of yi phi i of x. That's it. And it's a solve a linear system. The, 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 the Lagrange is such a sneaky guy. This is my polynomial interpolant. I didn't have to do a damn thing. Now do you guys see why this is a, a useful basis? So, let's think computationally for a minute. By the way, Mr. Mr. Fishberg, you look, you, look, you look suspicious. No, I just, sorry, I'm going back to signals again. This is why they do second order filters. Yeah, sure, second order filters. And, and <laughs> here's, the, here's the complex plane, and there's a pole, yeah, yeah, yeah. some circles, frequency, content, like that weird Greek letter that I don't know how to write. <laughs> Zeta. Zeta, yeah, no, we're, we're not gonna. Or what's the, the, the made up one in the black Scholes equation? Yeah, the Black-Scholes equation has a fake Greek letter in it. Um, I digress. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I got distracted making fun of my student. Um, does everybody understand uh, the, the expression here? Get a little too comfortable in lecture here. Um, now, it took us cubic time to do our interval before. Uh, what does this thing do? How, how long does this take? 
linear time. Let's think for a minute. Yeah, so, so we have to, so it's sort of linear time, like in terms of like the number of terms in the sum, but each term is a big product. So this whole thing is quadratic time. Like it does, I don't have to invert a matrix anymore, but still like evaluating this guy um, still is a bit of a pain. Now that's not entirely true if I'm willing to have a really ugly numerical algorithm, because notice I could take the previous guy, like kind of divide it by x minus two and multiply it by x or something like that and kind of get to the next one. So it might be that there's like some cumulative trick that you can do, but, it, but it's a priori it's not entirely clear that you can do such a thing. Yeah? Okay, so this is the sort of opposite extreme, right? The Lagrange basis, certainly on paper at least, is, is mathematically extremely convenient. Um, and uh, it spans exactly the same set. The, notice, if I have four x, i, y, i pairs, meaning that I can fit a cubic to my data, I could do two things, right? I could use the Lagrange basis, Option A. Option B, I could write, you know, solve the Vandermond system and write it in monomials. I think there's a really important point here, which is that the result of those two things will be the same function f, right? Like the coefficients will look different because in one basis it's the phi, in the other basis is the p's and, and the notation we've chosen here. But the actual function, there is a unique degree three polynomial that goes through that data, and, and that's the thing that you will get. Okay. So anyway, that's our, our interpolant. It has this nice form. It's very tidy, extremely, uh, I almost said ethical, uh, extremely efficient, um, possibly ethical. Uh, and and, and it's, it's sort of quadratic time to evaluate. Um, there's still some numerical is issues. In particular, notice there's a giant product here. And so if the x's are very close to each other, uh, you, can, you can run into some problems. Okay. So oftentimes, we want something that's like sort of numerically okay-ish and also something that's efficient. So um, we might ask if there's some kind of happy middle ground in between these two options. And of course, the answer is yes. Um, and it is named after another famous mathematician. There's so many polynomials. There's what we've already seen Lagrange. Um, it, the next one we're going to have is the Newton polynomials. Because of course, you know, he had his fingers in everything. Um, and the Newton basis looks a little something like this. So, uh, oops, oh no. Um, I define psi one to just be the function in one. And now I'm gonna make every element of my Newton basis be the previous element times x minus xj for one more j. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's do uh, an example. This is kind of fun because it actually relates to a previous lecture in this course. Which I think is fun. You know, numerical analysis, sadly, is one of these fields that secretly is really cumulative. Like, there's a reason we're building up all these tools uh, in the particular order that we do. Um, okay. So, uh, remember, we've got the same, like, x's here, 0, 2, 3, and 4. So, what would be my, my basis now? So, psi 1 of x is just, equivalent, uh, just completely equal to 1 everywhere. Psi 2 of x. Remember the trick here is just um, I take the previous guy and I multiply by x minus xj. So here the first x is just 0, right? Psi 3 of x is equal to, well now x times x minus 2. Psi 4 is equal to x, x minus 2, x minus 3, like that. Okay, those are my, my this is my new basis. First of all, do I write it psi 5? I'm tempted to. It is actually no. I actually stop here, which is, it feels a little weird because we <laughs> just like kind of ignored the last x. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see why this is okay in a moment. Notice it's certainly okay, like if I want to keep it polynomials, I got four of them so I can stop, right? Um, in fact, if I do another one, it won't be cubic anymore, right? It'll be quartic. <sighs> now, why on earth would I do this? So first of all, by the way, here's what this basis looks like. And notice, it has kind of an interesting property, which is as follows. Let's say that I look at psi i of x j, like that. Right? This is sort of our usual trick, like what we did in the Lagrange basis, right? which is to substitute in the x's. Now the first guy, we can't say a heck of a lot. It's just equal to 1. So it doesn't seem to have any roots at all. This guy does have a root at 0. Right? This one has a root at 0 and 2. So at the very least, we can say the following, right? That this is equal to 0 if j is less than i. 
you see that just by construction? Hopefully I got the order right. Yes, I did. Okay. So why do I do that? So let's say that I want to do regression in the Newton basis. Right, so I have a bunch of, of coefficients, maybe C1, C2, C3, C4, right in front of each of the slides. And I plug in my XY pairs. What expression am I going to get? Well, I'll just put it on the screen here. It looks a little something like this. Notice that here I have applied this box expression, right? Because of basically, what do I know? Well, I know that when I evaluate this function um, at x1, the only psi that isn't 0 at x1 is the first psi. Does that make sense? I evaluate at x2, the only one that is 0 are the first two. OK? Sneaky, huh? So now I have a matrix as my unknowns. I guess C, I don't know, what did I choose? C1 to CK is equal to y1 to yk. So in our first example, this was the Vandermeijen matrix. The second example, this was basically the identity. Um, what can we say about this matrix? What's, 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 it's, what, what happens here? Actually, absolutely right. This is a lower triangular matrix. That's what we just showed. Right? So in particular, how long does it take for us to invert uh, such a thing? Quadratic time. Which is great, because like already the Lagrange basis is going to be quadratic time anyway. Yeah? So this is an order n squared linear system to uh, solve. Um, so by the way, when we talk about um, time, there's sort of the, like the pre-computation time and then the evaluation time. Right? So Lagrange is zero pre-computation time and then quadratic evaluation time. Um, what about this guy? This is actually linear evaluation time. Do you see that? Because Every psi is just one factor times the psi before it. So if you write your code the right way, you kind of go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You just take the previous psi and you multiply it by another factor. So you can code this with a single for loop. Yep. Excellent. That's right. We can reuse them in the sense that like, we can query it at any x that we want. But if we change our input data, then yeah, you've got to run this procedure again. Yeah. This is kind of like, you know, like in, in machine learning these days, we talk about like, the time it takes to train your neural network and then the time it, to, to evaluate it. It's, it's a very similar split happening here. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You can think of these as different ways to kind of factor your Vandermond matrix. Which makes good sense, right? Because like at the end of the day, these are all just change of basis, right? In fact, if you take um, 64400 here at MIT, the intro graphics class, you'll spend a lot of time writing exactly that, which is change of basis between different polynomials. Um, an important plot point, actually, relative to, to Harry's question is, is exactly that. All three of these methods give you exactly the same interpolant, right? They're just different ways to skin the same cat. Um, and, and so because of that, Paul, sorry, I'm, I should use a different phrase. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, the, these procedures all give you exactly the same function. It's just a question of trade-off between pre-computation time and evaluation time. Does that make sense? Um, but yeah, here's absolutely right. Uh, there, there, in fact, if you want to understand this as a matrix factorization, here's a very simple way to, to do that. Um, let's see if I can reconstruct this theory from my undergrad graphics class. Um, this is a dangerous moment here. So in general, I can think of, and by the way, yeah, the reason that we do this in graphics is that these things have very geometric meaning. Um, so in, in graphics class, you introduce a few more bases for polynomials. Uh, in fact, I don't think you do introduce these two. You, you introduce the Bezier and the B-spline basis, which are the ones that are common in graphics. And those are used to do things like I have, I'm sure you've played with this PowerPoint tool where you draw a curve and you specify two points and two tangents. And then it kind of gives you like a little curve that goes through them like that. This is just a cubic polynomial behind the scenes, right? So there is a similar basis to the uh, Lagrange basis, but now your input data isn't four points, it's two points and two derivatives, right? So this particular basis is called Bezier. Because again, every French guy needs a basis. Um, then there's another one called B-spline, where you have like a whole sequence of points 
and I want like sort of one polynomial that goes through the first three and then another one that agrees to first order at this point and goes through the next three and so on. Um, this is another one, this is called B spline. Um, what are some other good bases for polynomials? There's a bunch. What was that? Nerves are non-rational, non-uniform rational B splines. You might notice rational there. Uh, nerves are, are not polynomials, they are rational functions. Yeah. One thing you might notice about polynomial interpolants, the, the one thing they can't draw is a circle, which turns out to be kind of an important object in a lot of graphics tools. Um, there's some really sneaky ways around that. One of them, which is what nerves does. I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. Ha, ah, tangent. Um, but but these, are, these are actually fun tools you might as well know. Um, nerves uh, does the following. They actually are polynomial curves, but in the projective plane. So uh, in particular, um, let's see if I can get this right. Oh, can I get this right? I can get this right. So, 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 so let's say that I have t square root of 1 minus t squared. This thing traces out a circle, at least the upper half of a circle. So here's a kind of sneaky trick. I instead, uh, think of this thing as, uh, oh, how do, I, how do you end up doing this? I forget. So you, you stick a third coordinate on here, and then you identify any two vectors that are multiples of each other like this, right? Um, so in particular, um, what do you want to multiply to get this thing to be? Uh, there's some way to turn this thing into a, a polynomial that I'm, I'm missing. How do you, <laughs> you can scale this thing by <laughs> some damn thing and you get a polynomial. Chris, help me out. How do I, how do I get a polynomial out of this in the, in the projective plane? Do you want basically... Oh, ah, shoot. I forget. If you go, uh, this is the beginning of how you derive a <laughs> polynomial curve in the <laughs> plane that, that, that draws a circle, and I, I'm, I'm going to waste time. But I was, I was answering Harry's question, and I've gotten in too deep. So let's, let's do that instead, and then I'll keep thinking about this. Um, that's embarrassing. I should, I'm, I'm a graphics geometry professor. I should know how to draw a circle. Uh, right, so, so let's say that I'm in the monomial basis, 1x x squared x cubed. In computer graphics, it's almost cubic, by the way, like almost always cubic. Um, you can think of your, for example, if I write a uh, function in this basis, you can think of it kind of like a row vector. I have coefficients in front of the monomial basis, right? So relative to Harry's question, which is, can you think of all these things as matrix factorizations? Absolutely. So for example, um, here we have on the board, 1x, x minus 2, x times x minus 2 times x minus 3, right? Notice that I can write that as a matrix, right? So in particular, I can do 1, 2, of, ah, x, x times x minus 2, which is really x squared minus 2x, and then all of this thing times x minus 3, which is wh whatever it is, uh, like this, right? So notice that there's a 1, 0, 0, 0, got a 0, 1, 0, 0. We have an x squared minus 2x, so 0 minus 2, 1, 0, and then the fourth row, which I don't feel like computing, right? And so you had, um, if you had a, something in the monomial basis, right, it was like a vector in front of this thing, you know. Now if I write a uh, function in uh, the Newton basis, right? So this is kind of like a row vector pre-multiplying this guy, right? So if I stick that row vector here and I parenthesize this way, <laughs> then what I'll get is a change of basis that puts it back in the monomials, right? So these are all different factorizations of, of, of matrices. Okay. I'm bothered by the fact that I can't remember how to do my, how to draw a circle. How do you do that? Shoot. That's embarrassing. There's, such a, there's some sneaky way to get. Chris, can you Google this really quickly? How do you, like, drawing a circle in projective plane with polynomials? <laughs> I know it, it goes with t square root of 1 minus t squared, and then you reshape it a little bit. I don't remember how. Um, okay. So in any event, uh, that's, that's polynomial interpolation. Now we can in, uh, generalize in different ways. One of them is rational interpolation, to go back to uh, Paul's question. He didn't even know he was asking it, but he was. Um, which looks for functions of this form. What falls apart about our strategy from the previous couple of slides? 
so if I'm given a bunch of xy pairs, but initially now it looks nonlinear, right? Like now I'm dividing by q's, and, and that becomes problematic, right? Is that really the case? Specifically for rational interpolation? The answer is actually no, right? Because I can take the denominator and I can multiply both sides by it, right? So in particular, um, if I multiply both sides by the denominator, I get this expression here for each i, right? That yi times the denominator evaluated at xi is equal to the numerator evaluated at xi. And this is a linear expression in the p's and the q's. Right? So actually the, the strategies from the previous couple of slides almost apply. <laughs> right? This expression is linear in the p's and the q's. So we can use linear algebra to try and solve it. Right? But there's actually two things that we have to be careful about. Um, first of all, this matrix has a null space. Do you see that if I scale the p's and the q's by the same constant, then I get the same rational function. Um, so in other words, there's like a non-unique solution to this linear system of equation. Um, and in fact, because of that, you can end up with, and notice that like our implies arrow goes from top to bottom, right? It says if f of x equals that, then this expression on the bottom is true, right? What we didn't show is if the expression on the bottom is true, then f of x is equal to this thing, right? And can we think of a case where it's not? This is like a little, like the tiniest bit subtle. So let's actually do an example. Let's say that I have linear function in the numerator and the denominator. Okay, um, which feels easy. Uh, and I, I, I have the, uh, these are my x, y pairs, so 0, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 2. Okay, so in other words, um, my f of x here is equal to p0 plus p1x. Then we've got q0 plus q1x, like that. Okay, so then now when I, I translate to my linear system, remember what it is. It's like y times this equals that for each x, y pair, right? So in particular, um, my first one is uh, x is 0 and y is 1, right? So I have 1 times q0 equals p0, right? So in other words, uh, q0 equals p0. Does everybody agree that that's the first relationship I get? You should, because it is. Um, the next one is uh, 1 comma 2. From this one, I will get 2 times q0 plus q1 is equal to p0 plus p1. So far, we're, we're so good. And then the next one, uh, we've got uh, 2 comma 2. So we will get 2 times q0 plus 2q1 is equal to p0 plus 2p1. Okay? So this is a linear system in the p's and the q's, right? I don't want to say a linear system because notice that like if I set all the p's equal to 0 and all the q's equal to 0, that would solve this, which isn't so good, but maybe I like fix one of these guys and solve for the rest or something like that. But even there, you can end up in trouble. So for example, here I'm just going to give you a solution to this. P0 equals 0, P1 equals 2, Q0 equals 0, Q1 equals 1. Here, you want to check really quick that this satisfies these linear systems? No? Okay, yeah, me, me neither. Okay, but what we can do is plug into this form for f of x. What are we going to get? So we'll get p0 plus p1x, so that's just 2x. And then we'll get q0 plus q1x. So there's our, our, our rational function. Does this actually satisfy my input data? No, it doesn't. It doesn't satisfy this data point. Essentially what happened is that I, I divided by 0. Right? And so this is a case where <laughs> this uh, second condition here is necessary, but it's not sufficient for the first one. You, you actually have to go back and check. Yeah. Okay. Now, there are obviously some easy ways to kind of avoid issues like this. Uh, but, but when you write your linear algebra code for, for solving this system, it's not enough to just use like backslash and MATLAB. Yeah. Any questions so far? So, ah, yes. Why do I want one of these things? Rational functions. For one, um, you can draw a circle if, 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 if you're not an idiot. Like, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll, come, I'll Google this later and, and email you guys. No, but, but it's a more expressive set of functions. Um, there's just a lot of things out there that are not polynomials. Um, rationals also have like, nice behavior at infinity oftentimes. Like you can, you know, they, they tend to converge to like zero or to some function whose asymptote is kind of simple. Um, whereas uh, polynomials often diverge. 
um, which could be a problem. Yeah. It's also, uh, by the way, kind of an interesting theoretical thing, which we are not going to get to cover in this class. But if you like this kind of thing, there's a search term that I'm currently forgetting because I'm not an expert in interpolation, um, which is uh, we, we talk about polynomials a ton because we're used to thinking about Taylor series. Um, you could also approximate functions with um, rational functions. What was that? Pede approximation. See, as usual, Harry, Harry knows what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, there, there is sort of a, a, an analogous uh, setup called Pede approximation, where now you are allowing to approximate a function with a numerator and a denominator instead of just a uh, numerator. And oftentimes you can get away with a far lower degree polynomial with the same level of, of approximation quality. That is a vastly over, vast overgeneralization of that theory. Um, in my practical experience, PET is, is, is absolutely great until you actually try it. But, you know, that's um, in here for me. It's really annoying because I solve, like, in my, every, in my like, day job when I'm not teaching you guys, I, I, like, I work on PDEs that fall squarely into what the PET PD, people care about. And I've never managed to use them well. But I, that, that's on me. <laughs> okay, uh, right. So, so in any event, that's our, our polynomial approximation story. Polynomials are, are, are fabulous. They're really simple to work with. They exemplify a lot of the considerations that, that we have to think about when we do interpolation. The only problem is that they're not practical at all. Um, and in particular, uh, here's a typical issue. Like one thing you might notice, I mentioned that computer graphics people only ever use polynomials of, of up to degree three. And then what they'll do is they'll kind of glue them together with like different you know, levels of continuity rather than using a higher degree polynomial. You might ask why, um, and here's why. So here are what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points uh, here on, on, on the, the real line. So we have a degree, I guess, seven polynomial. Now the unique degree polyno uh, seven polynomial where all of the y's are equal to one half is just f of x equals one half, right? That's it. But now I could do a very simple thing, which is like the tiniest bit evil. It's not evil at all. Actually, this is a completely reasonable situation, which is my data is a little noisy. And the middle data point here, data point number four, I displace ever so slightly. And now I do the interpolation of this thing. Now, this weird funky curve function that I'm drawing, <laughs> it, notice that it still interpolates all the remaining data points. The only difference was that it goes through the white point instead of the black one. That is actually the unique degree, I guess, seven polynomial that goes through these things. So in other words, making a local change to my data has global effect in my interpolant. Does that make sense? This is not a fantastic property, <laughs> right? So in other words, like a, a, a different way to think about that is all of our basis functions so far, like all of the, like, the monomials and, and Lagrange basis, Newton basis, uh, Bezier basis, B spline basis, what are some other polynomial bases? There's so many, Chebyshev basis. All of them have, they're non-zero everywhere, <laughs> right? So like if I, I change the coefficient in front of one of these basis functions, my function changes globally. Does that make sense? Everybody on board? Actually, you look a little. Hmm. Hmm. So like the, the basic point here is that like as, as interpolants go, we have successfully interpolated our data, but we, we have some unexpected behavior in between. That's, that's the high level point. Um, by the way, this is related to uh, something, um, R-U-N-G-E phenomenon. I believe his name is German. I don't know how to pronounce it, and I never will. I've made peace with this at the beginning of my career. That's why there are R-K integrators, they're not Runge-Kutta integrators. Um, but in any event, this is called the Runge phenomenon. And the basic idea here is that polynomials are really wiggly in, in annoying, uncontrollable ways, and we shouldn't use high, high, high degree ones. We can avoid it. Okay, so an alternative design decision we might make is to choose a basis with what we might say has compact support, meaning that outside of some region it's equal to zero. Right? Because in that case, when I change the coefficient in front of one of my basis functions, notice that like that has some effect on my function locally, but then outside of that that region of support, that's no longer the case. Does that make sense? Now there's so many different bases of compact support; they're not polynomials necessarily. In fact, I challenge you to prove that polynomials can't have compact support. Um, so let's go through a few examples. Here's probably the world's dumbest interpolant, which is um, sometimes in computer science we call this na nearest neighbor interpolation. It's kind of a, 
you know, I, I, I think describe pretty well what's going on here, which is I have values of a function at a set of x's. And so for a new x, I, want value, I predict its value, what do I do? I just find the closest x where I do have data and I copy that value. Right? Notice like here's a plot of the interpolant that I get. Now in numerical analysis, we like to use as many words as possible to describe what's happening here. So we often call this piecewise constant interpolation. Notice it makes perfect sense because of course this is just a bunch of constants, <laughs> one, one, one per piece, yeah? Um, but, but the one uh, uh, thing that maybe is not obvious to you guys or, or is not the way that you're used to thinking about it, notice that this is still a set of basis functions, right? In particular, if I make a basis function which is equal to one when my closest point is xi and zero otherwise, then I've successfully written nearest neighbor interpolation as a linear combination of these phi's. In fact, notice that the interpolant, by the way, looks exactly the same as Lagrange interpolation in this form, right? The phi's are different, but the, the formula's the same. That makes sense? So, piecewise constant feels a little bit brain dead. I mean, for one, it is discontinuous. So let's say I wanted one more level of continuity. What should I do? Piecewise linear. Thanks, Paul. So here's piecewise linear interpolation. It's got a bunch of straight lines. A reasonable question to ask here is like, can I write this thing in a basis, right? And there's actually sort of two answers to that, right? So the, the, the obvious basis here would be to have like kind of an AX equals B just kind of chopped off at each interval like we had for piecewise constant. But that would sort of defeat the purpose here. That piecewise linear, you really want it to be like at least continuous. And so that's not a very good basis, right? Because then you could have functions that are like, you know, I don't know, down and then over here. And then like, you know, it looks kind of like that like solo cup from the 80s with the, anyway, you know, like this thing. Okay, uh, but uh, there is a basis that we can use um, that doesn't have this property. Anybody know the name of this basis? Yeah, triangle basis. It also has a cuter name than that, so that's the one in my book. Um, this is the hat basis. <laughs> Not to be confused with the Mexican hat wavelet, which is a different hat. Um, but I digress. So the, the hat basis, um, or as Paul says, the triangle basis, is basically two lines, right? One that goes from zero at the previous data point to one at the current data point, and then one that goes from one back to zero. So notice that once again, interpolation in this basis basically follows that Lagrange formula again because I've designed my basis to be one at xi and zero at all the other xj's. Sneaky, huh? So I like this basis. And moreover, you can convince yourself, I mean, clearly this is is linear in every interval. So really the interpolants that you get are exactly like, like they look like this. I think somehow there's like a funny intuition because it like has like a little hat shape that the interpolant should look like a hat, but it, it doesn't, it's just, it's just a bunch of lines. Does this construction make sense? This is gonna be a really important basis if we end up talking about finite element method, which we might do in the very last lecture of this course. This is like the only one that, that, that people know how to work with in, in certain versions of PDE. Okay, so, so that, that sort of concludes our discussion of one-dimensional interpolation. I think the good, the good news here is the math here is so much easier than, than the stuff we've done the last couple of weeks. It's very tangible and easy to think about. Um, for multi-dimensional interpolation, things are, are equally kind of straightforward. So now um, our function that we're trying to compute is from Rn to R instead of R. Notice our strategies don't really work anymore. Like we don't have, it's not so obvious what the hat basis should be, for example. We can still use polynomials, but like the number of them starts to blow up as n gets big, right? Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do. We could go through the last list of bases and, and kind of work out kind of similar analogies to each one. So for example, nearest neighbor interpolation is still perfectly fine. You might ask like what is the basis for the nearest neighbor interpolation for a bigger dimension than one, right? Before, remember, it was those little line segments. Now you get something called a Voronoi diagram. Have you guys encountered Voronoi diagrams before, like in geometry class? Right, so the Voronoi cell, I have a bunch of xi's, is the set of points that are closer to xi than to any of the other xj's. Right? That's the way I think about Voronoi cell. And so if you think about it, inside of each Voronoi cell, my nearest neighbor interpolant is constant, right? So the way to think about that nearest neighbor interpolation is that there's a bunch of basis functions, one per cell. There are these weirdly shaped objects like this, um, and that's really what's getting controlled. Does that make sense? Um, there are other interpolants out there. So for example, um, one thing people do is barycentric interpolation. Um, and this will be like specifically, um, let's say that I have 
uh, my function, and it's prescribed on the corners of a triangle. Okay, so I know f at three locations. That make sense? So I might make an assumption here, which is that inside of this triangle, f is linear. Does that make sense? So, so let's say that I'm on the plane specifically, right? So I have a function that maybe looks like f of x equals c1 plus c2x plus c3y, right? That would be kind of the linear affine function here. So notice that I have three degrees of freedom, and I have three points on my triangle, so I can actually solve this linear system of equations, which is good. And what I get is the barycentric interpolant. So a different way to think about it is as follows. If I take a point x in the inside of the triangle, I can write it as a weighted linear combination of the three vertices, right? So like uh, here, uh, a1, a2, and a3. And then I can just reuse those weights to interpolate the values of f from the three corners of the triangle, and that turns out to be exactly the same as this uh, thing here. Um, but it gives us kind of a cute form for our interpolant. Do you see that? So like here are like the y's are the values of the corners of the triangle, and the a's are like the weightings. So that you guys can understand this little formula here. Um, in 2D, by the way, a fun picture people uh, often draw in computer graphics, it turns out that the three barycentric weights are, are very intuitive. They Essentially what you do is you compute, you, you, you take a triangle, you divide it into three at P, the way that I've done here, and the weight of, for example, vertex three is, proportional, is the area of the triangle opposite vertex three. So I flip over to the other side, divided by the area of the entire triangle. That is not obvious for the formula I wrote on this, this, the slide before. I'll let you guys prove that one at home if you get bored. I think the most efficient way to show that formula is using that Kramer's rule thing that nobody likes for linear algebra class. Um, yeah, so but, uh, this is the most common type of interpolation in, in computer graphics domain. Um, people will like store things on vertices or triangle meshes, and this is how you do shading, um, if you want bad shading on, on 3D models. Um, and it's extremely efficient to compute very fast on your, your graphics card. Um, one side note, you might ask a question, which is like, well, what if I have, I don't have a triangle, blah, I have some other polygon, I don't know, with four vertices, and now I want to interpolate the values to the interior of this shape, right? Well, I could try to do barycentric interpolation, but I run into a problem, which is that it's underdetermined. Do you see that the... Like if I wanted, I could take any point here and write it as a linear combination of these four corners, right? So I have four weights in front of these four corners. The four weights have to sum up to one, so I really have three degrees of freedom. But I have two pieces of data, the x, y coordinates of this point on the board. This is an underdetermined problem. So there's actually a model, this is an opportunity to do some modeling. There's actually different functions out there that people use. Um, I, I just thought you, I'd give you a fun Google search term for later. Um, often this is called uh, generalized barycentric coordinates, where people compute barycentric coordinates relative to a polygon with more than three vertices, and then they have to start coming up with other assumptions to break that underdeterminedness. Like, for example, smoothness is a function of x. Um, today, I guess, like, I'm trying to make today's lecture interesting because I feel like interpolation is usually boring. This is another modern research topic, like how people do this. There's some really beautiful connections. If you do this in 2D, do the complex plane. People use tricks from complex analysis to get, like, interesting... You might say, like, well, I'm going to use this thing to deform the shape like I have here, so maybe I want it to like, kind of look like a conformal mapping of the shape, so then I can invoke things from that theory. Or, in fact, uh, these days, I can tell you with confidence, because it was a publication from my research group a few weeks ago, um, you can even use neural networks to, to parameterize these objects and then like, optimize for their smoothness and this kind of stuff. This is a uh, fun open space. Um, the other thing that, that I should mention when we talk about half functions is that they allow us to come up, oh shoot, when I, when I talk about barycentric coordinates, is they allow us to come up with an analogy of half functions. Do you see that? So now, um, let's say that I have, for example, a triangle mesh in the plane, and I have the value of a function at every vertex, then I can linearly interpolate that value to the interior of every triangle. Right? And, and in effect, that's using barycentric coordinate restricted to each triangle on this mesh. And when you look at the resulting basis, it's what we call the hat basis, just like one on a single vertex and zero on all the other vertices. So it's kind of like a little hat at every vertex that drops off. Again, we'll talk about this a little more if we do finite element method. My goal is maybe to derive the Laplacian operator in a couple weeks just because it's fun and I'm a big fan of Laplacian. 
I think in every class that I teach at MIT, we kind of conclude with that somehow. Um, there's a few other interpolation tools that are worth noting. Um, the obvious one ah, is uh, interpolation on a grid. Um, I think this is probably the one that you guys probably have actually coded or worked with on your computer. So for example, if I have a photograph and I want to zoom in and enhance, <laughs> then the simplest way that I could do that, you know, I have uh, pixels, which are like these little corners of the square. Now if I want to interpolate at a vertex on the inside, I just linearly interpolate along the edges and then into the inside. That makes sense? This is often called bilinear interpolation. One thing that, that is worth noting is that this is a polynomial interpolant, right? Because I did linear things twice. It's quadratic on the inside. Um, it's not necessarily the best fit, like quadratic by certain criteria. It's just like, like the, the thing to know about the bilinear basis is it knows that you have an XY coordinate. <laughs> like this is a hard thing to deal with under rotation. Yes? Um, the by is that I did linear in X and then linear in Y. Yeah, and then I multiplied them together. So my basis ends up looking like X times Y for each pair. So it's, um, if you are in algebraic geometry or in certain corners of computer-aided geometric design, these are interesting polynomials because they are degree two, there's a product of X and Y, but they are, um, so the, the phrase that people use is they are total degree two, um, and there's, other, some, there's another species of degree, which is just in any one variable at a time. It's degree one. Right? So it's kind of a weird function that way. Okay. In the last little 10 minutes, I thought I'd mention that like, interpolation also is accompanied by a lot of theory. <laughs> um, and there's all kinds of different ways that people derive the interpolants out there in practice. This is going to appeal to those of us that like the Fourier transform. Um, in particular, we can look at the sort of span of a set of polynomials as some little approximation of the space of all possible functions. And then there's a lot of questions that people ask about like, what is the convergence rate of that approximation? How well can I do? How many polynomials do I need? Can I approximate anything arbitrarily well? Right, the good news is the answer is like kind of yes, <laughs> for some version of well. Um, so in order to do that, um, based on the homework that you guys did, this is, is, is a familiar object, um, you might need to be able to compute dot products and distances, not just between vectors of numbers, but also between functions. Okay, so this leads us to this L2 inner product object that we've seen a, a few times on and off in this course. And that allows us to ask things like, you know, to, to, for example, I could pose polynomial approximation as a least squares problem, right? Like I could ask, you know, what is the best degree three polynomial that fits a particular type of data? So like maybe my, my data is some function like e to the x. So I've got f of x on the one hand. I've got some polynomial of degree maybe n on the other hand. I could literally ask like, what is the optimal over all pn is a polynomial of degree n of the uh, L2 norm of f of x minus pn of x. Right, this is a perfectly well-posed problem for a lot of choices of f of x. This is kind of a weird norm, right? Notice that here, what I really mean is the integral from maybe 0 to 1 of f of x minus pn of x squared dx. Right? This is the least squares problem, where here my unknowns are like the coefficient of this p. This leads to yet another basis for polynomials that makes calculations like this easy. Anybody know this one? So for example, notice that like in general, this gives us a dot product, right? This is like some analogy of an inner product between functions. And the second that we have dot products, we can ask what it means to be perpendicular or orthogonal, right? Orthogonal things have dot product equal to zero. And conveniently in this class, we have a procedure for making things orthogonal. What is it, you guys remember what's this one called? Gram-Schmidt. Right? So here's a really weird thing that I can do. I can take the monomial basis, right? So p0 x equal to 1, p1 x equal to x, p2 of x equals x squared, and so on. And I can apply Gram-Schmidt to this set with this inner product. <laughs> this is an abstract thing, but it's going to give me yet another basis for polynomials. And it's kind of convenient for solving least squares problems like the one here. And in particular, that basis, we're not going to do that calculation because we're low on time. It's in the textbook, so it's not, it's not hard, it's just annoying. We'll lead you to the Legendre basis. Clearly, I'm fluent in French. Um, or if you choose a different inner product where I put 1 over x uh, square root of 1 minus uh, x squared here. This is still an inner product. It turns out to be kind of nice. Um, then you get another basis for polynomial. It's called the Chebyshev basis. 
Um, there's a little bit of discussion in the book about sort of why you might want to use these different bases and some of the theoretical insight you get by, by working in such a thing, right? Like, they make it easier to talk about approximation quality. Like, what degree do I need in order to approximate a function of some level of craziness? Okay. Um, so we can ask questions like, what is the uh, least squares approximation of a function f in a set of polynomials? And that, that's going to be answered using bases like this. Because notice that now, um, if I have some quadrature method for approximating this integral, um, one kind of convenient thing about the Lagrange basis, you know, whenever I work in an orthogonal basis, is that like, in order to answer this, all I need is the dot product between f of x and p0, f of x and p1, and so on. Right? I don't have to solve a linear system. Okay. Um, the final thing that's worth noting, uh, the other type of theory that we should talk about a tiny bit in approximation is approximation quality, right? Which says that like, if I have some function that's maybe Lipschitz or like it's gradient derivative or bounded in a particular interval. I might ask, like, how much error do I get by approximating it with the best possible polynomial? Right? It's a reasonable question to ask. And the answer is, is here, and it's, it's totally unsurprising, that essentially, uh, in particular, if I have um, a function f of x, <clears throat> f, which goes from the interval a comma b into the real numbers, and maybe f is infinitely differentiable just to make my life a little easier, I could ask, um, you know, if I look at delta x is equal to b minus a, and I approximate f with a polynomial, um, what's going to be the amount of error that I incur, right? And it turns out this is an easy enough thing to do. So for example, um, I think the easiest one is to approximate f with a constant, c, you know, um, as follows. So in particular, um, maybe I take c to be equal to f of a plus b over 2. That's supposed to be a 2. Right? It seems like a reasonable approximation. <laughs> so then I can ask, like, what is the approximation error of that? So one way to do it in the soup norm is to look at the following quantity. We're going to take the max over all possible x's of f of x minus c. Right? This is some notion of, of error, pretty strong notion of error, actually. Yeah. Well, one thing that you can do is apply the mean value theorem, everybody's favorite theorem from calculus. What does the mean value theorem say? It kind of says that like the value, the change of value of your function at any interval is like related to the, the derivative, right? Like there's some point in there where the derivative, the linearization of your function about that point actually kind of gives you the change of values. So in particular, this thing is less than or equal to delta x times the max over x in this interval of f prime. I think even if you forgot the mean value theorem and you didn't feel like arguing, this is a pretty intuitive statement, right? So like essentially, this is just saying that if this is the rate of change, if I take the max rate of change and multiply it by the width of my interval, that's, that's the error, right? So notice that this thing, assuming that I'm in C infinity, this is really just big O of delta x, which is what we uh, claimed on this screen here. So basically, the point here is if I use a piecewise constant interpolant, then I have big O of delta x uh, uh, error. And so like, there, there's a reasonable question, which is like, if I have 10 quadrature points, um, so basically, I sample my function 10 times. I shouldn't use the word phrase quadrature point yet, because we, we haven't done quadrature. If I have 10 uh, evaluation points, I can interpolate that in, in, in these two different ways. right? I could do nearest neighbor, or I could do linear. And essentially, this theory is trying to describe like why our intuition is that, that the linear stuff is better. One way to do this is say, OK, well, the error of this thing on any one of these intervals is bounded by delta x. One thing that you can show, I think we're out of time, so I'm not going to bother now, is that the error of a piecewise linear interpolant using kind of a Taylor series argument is delta x squared. Now, what does that mean? That means for the same set of samples, I can possibly squeeze out a little bit more accuracy in my approximate um, by using the piecewise linear interpolation as opposed to the piecewise constant one, at least under the assumption that f is, is, is sort of bounded and well behaved. Which is, I think, the intuition we all have. Now, you have to be careful because essentially, what do you think we're going to find? Like, for a degree n polynomial, your error kind of looks like delta n, delta x to the n plus 1. But we also know that there are these really crazy, wiggly examples of polynomials. Those two things feel kind of like at odds, right? And here's, here's where the, those, those two theories meet together. This theory is saying, what is the best possible approximation in the whole set of degree n polynomials? Well, it's pretty good <laughs> in this interval. 
It doesn't tell you how to find it. Right? And it might be that that approximation is not one of the interpolates we've talked about today. So this is a bit of a theoretical object. Now, there are ways to minimize the difference between these two things. If you Google for Chebyshev points and all these clever ways of choosing the XIs to minimize the wiggliness of their polynomials, there's, there's some, some clever stuff to be done. But luckily for me, we are at the end of the hour and I don't have to talk about it. So, in any event, that's our whirlwind introduction to uh, interpolation tools. There's also, as usual, slides on the course website and textbook. Have a lovely Thanksgiving. When we get back, we'll talk about quadrature. All right. Let me turn off the recording so I don't fill up my hard drive for the third time. <laughs>